Good morning, everybody. If you know the words to that song, you can sing along while Wally starts the music this morning. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Oh, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender everybody and so glad to see everybody here in their places with bright and shiny faces. Um, this is the Lord's Day. You know we celebrate really Easter Sunday every, excuse me, Easter Sunday every Sunday because we gather together to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that's why we're gathered here this morning. If Christ be not raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Then we are the greatest fools of all time. But the truth is that Christ has risen from the dead. And that we have a lively hope, it says in the Bible. A living hope that we share today as believers in Christ. And as I said the last couple of times I've stood here, you know, these are certainly unusual times. And these are different times for all of us, but different is not bad. Different is just different. And so we gather together in this way, and I believe that we can please the Lord as we do so this morning. I want to welcome each one of you here this morning. Um, many of you have a printed bulletin. Uh, if you perchance don't have one, um, please make a note of it or contact the church office. We'll make sure that uh, either you get one by um, an email attachment or a printed copy for next Sunday. And um, we, we would like everybody to have a bulletin so you can follow along um, from your homes or from your vehicles. If there are any announcements that need to be broadcast, uh, please contact me or Rusty or someone in the church office and I will make sure those announcements are um, taken care of. And if there's any prayer requests that are not on the prayer list, please, please make them known. You know, we are called to be a praying people. 
And as I said last week, if we don't pray, then who's going to? Certainly not those that don't have faith. And so we're called to pray, pray for each other and pray for our community and pray for our nation at this time. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to gather together in his name. And I'm so glad that each one of you are here and that we can worship the Lord together. Let's turn in our bulletins and we'll recite the call to worship together as found in your bulletin. We are called to worship the Lord our God. This is the call of all creation for, as the scripture teaches, the heavens declare the glory of God. And this is the call of God's holy prophets. For it is written, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And this is the call of our very hearts. For it is written that he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. So let us worship the Lord our God today. Amen. Our first hymn is number 195, Nothing But the Blood, and we'll sing all of the verses. confession of sin and and before we recite it together let me remind you that it's also a prayer of our confession of our faith because if we don't have faith in God then what who are we confessing to certainly not confessing to ourselves that won't do any good but we confess our sins to God and so it's an expression of our faith to say these words and may they be true in your heart together please hear our prayers O God 
You said in the book of Psalms, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. O oh God, our hands are not clean, and our hearts are far from pure. If you were to lay open our inner thoughts, our whispered words, our hidden actions for all to see, oh, how great would be our shame. But we come to you for forgiveness and cleansing. Hear our prayers, O oh God, and have mercy upon us. Make us the people you want us to be. Forgive us, cleanse us, heal us. We beg your pardon and we thank you for the gift of your Son, who even now sits at your right hand and ever lives to make intercession for us. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who is the way, the truth, in the life. Amen. And amen. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, I think the end of the chapter, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What wonderful words these are that give us that assurance that we can come to God. No matter our condition, no matter what happened yesterday, no matter the words that were spoken or the thoughts that were in our minds, we can come to God and ask for forgiveness and cleansing. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. How wonderful that is. And Jesus was asked, what's the greatest of all the commandments? And he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And there's another one that's fit with it. You can't separate them really. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws, on these two commandments is all the will of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer another time. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. You said where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you would be in our midst. And Lord, we celebrate that promise today that we can gather together in your name, whether we're seated separately or not, whether we're watching this on YouTube or not, we can gather together in your blessed name. And Lord, we thank you for that promise of your presence with us. Lord, we do pray, O oh God, we pray for all those who are suffering today, all those who are sick and infirm, all those who are in the hospital. We pray for all those who have been infected with this terrible virus. Lord, we just pray that you bring healing and help. We pray for all first responders and all medical staff and nurses and doctors and nursing home attendants and each one doing their part, each one doing their best to help in this dreadful situation. We pray that you give each one strength and help today. We pray for families and friends 
who have been separated by circumstances. Oh God, God, give us faith. Give us faith that our love does not need to grow cold. That even though we've had to change some of our ways, that our hearts can be full of love and full of peace in the midst of this storm. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for our country. We pray you'd bless the government, bless the leaders of our land. Lord, you have put them in their positions. And it's our responsibility to pray for them. And we pray your blessing upon our president, your blessing upon our vice president and the number of people around them. And your blessing upon Governor Cuomo and his staff. Oh God, each of these people need you very much, need your direction and wisdom. And Lord, we just pray you would grant it. Lord, hear our prayers. Come to us today. Help us through this time. Give us faith instead of fear. Give us hope instead of a feeling of hopelessness. And help us to know that you are seated upon the throne and you, you have not walked away. But you're with us even today. Lord, we just thank you for giving us this prayer to pray that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And together, let us recite, as found in your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. It's good to not just know this, but to recite it together as a body of believers. Here is our faith. This creed was hammered out centuries ago, hammered out by godly men who wanted to distill, put into a short form, the essentials, the, the foundation of everything that we believe. And so let's recite this together as people of God. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will enjoy a musical meditation now by Wally Jones.
Thank you, Wally. I'm sure many of you know that little tune. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me read three scriptures to you, and actually they're found on the back side of your bulletin, if you'd like to follow along. But these three scriptures, these three verses, I've chosen to to be the basis of my sermon this morning. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then finally, John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Dear Lord, we just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations in my heart would be acceptable in your sight. And Lord, I would say what you want me to say and say nothing more. That you would help each of us to hear what you want us to hear and nothing more. Lord, we thank you for the background of the calling of the birds. We thank you for this spring day. Bless, O oh God, bless this message and the rest of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. It is rather pleasant, isn't it? I don't know. I hope you can hear what I hear. I feel that, that I am being blessed just by the chirping of the birds. At least we don't have the howling of the dogs, do we? Well, you know, long ago... Uh, my brother-in-law, a brother-in-law, I used to visit him and his family down in Tennessee, and he loved to get out his mandolin and his guitar and his banjo, and I tell you, we had a good time just singing gospel songs, and, and you know, I remember one of the things that he said, he said, David, you've got a pretty good voice, I bet you 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 read music by note. And I said, well, yeah, I've, I've studied music and I, I can read the notes. And he said to me, well, I read by letter. And he said, I just open my mouth and let her fly. Well, that might be the case this morning right here. You know, I've got all kinds of notes and all kinds of material, but let's, let's pray for me. That I can open my mouth and just let her fly. So these three verses that I read are part, excuse me, I keep fiddling with my stand here, I'll just forget it here, are, are part of what is the longest and certainly one of the most profound discourses of our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17, really. But really it begins in the previous chapter, John 13, where Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 apostles, leaves that Passover meal and goes out into the night. Judas goes to betray Jesus, to go to the high priests, or the high priest and the staff there, the officials, to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. In this, this discourse, John 14, 15, 16, 17, goes all the way from there to the beginning of John chapter 18, where Judas reappear, reappears. And so it's kind of interesting that it, this, this long speech talked by Christ is kind of bookend 
by the, the disappearance of Judas and then the return of Judas. And in chapter 18, at the beginning, Judas reappears, not coming back to that upper room of the Passover meal, but rather coming to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he knew that Jesus and the 11 remaining apostles had gone to pray. Judas did not come back by himself, did he? He came back with a group of soldiers. Actually, the Bible says a multitude of soldiers. And Judas approaches Jesus, identifies him, and betrays him with a kiss. And thus begins that long and dark day that we now call Good Friday. We know what happens, don't we? We're familiar with this story. The soldiers arrest Jesus. They take him first to the residence of the high priest where he is accused. And then he's taken to a hastily assembled meeting of the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, where he is condemned, pummeled, spit upon, and scorned. And then he's taken to Pontius Pilate, where he is sentenced, flogged, and made a public spectacle. And then he's taken to a small hill just outside of the city walls, a hill that we call Calvary, where he is executed between two thieves. And the priests were there. The temple officials were there. And they said to him, if you are really who you say you are, come down from that cross. Prove to us that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Couldn't Jesus have done that? Couldn't Jesus have changed everything in a moment of time? Couldn't Jesus have come down from the cross and assumed a mantle of glory and crushed all of his enemies and established a glorious earthly kingdom right then and began to reign from a shining golden throne right there in Jerusalem, the city of the great king? Well, we know he certainly did not need his disciples' help, did he? He certainly did not need them to brandish their swords and fight. Peter had tried that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter drew his sword there, and he flailed it around and cut off a man's ear. And Jesus picked up that ear and healed the man. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter... Put up your sword. Don't you know that I could ask my father for help and my father would send 12 legions of angels to me immediately? Just think of that. 12 legions of angels. A legion of soldiers back then had between three and 7,000 men each legion. So 12 legions of angels would be between 40 and 85,000 angels that could have come to Christ's aid. And given the fact that one angel in the Old Testament was ready to destroy the city of Jerusalem, just think what 10,000 angels could do. But Jesus did not rescue himself, did he? Jesus willingly submitted to the cruelties, submitted to the humiliation, submitted to the beatings and the flogging. And Jesus willingly stretched out his arms and allowed those soldiers to pierce his hands and feet. And he willingly endured it all even to his death because God had a plan because Father knows best. 
because God allowed Judas to betray him. God used those proud, stiff-necked priests. And God used Pontius Pilate. And God used that old wooden cross. And all things were fulfilled. And all things were accomplished just as God the Father desired. And when Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished, it was. It was finished. All things were fulfilled. The work of opening up a way into God's kingdom was established. The old covenant of Moses and the law was nailed to that cross. In the new covenant, guaranteed and delivered to us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, was accomplished. Like that hymn we sang, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not the blood of bulls and goats. Not the slain of a hundred thousand Passover lambs. Not my good works or your good works. Not giving money, singing a hymn, and sitting in a pew or sitting in a car. Nothing. Nothing but the precious sinless blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. As someone once said, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. We are saved, we are rescued, we are spared the wrath of God because of Christ, in Christ alone. God had a plan, a wonderful plan. And Jesus knew what he was doing and knew what he was saying when he spoke those words in John 14 and John 16. Let me read them again. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 16, 31. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye shall have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That last verse, John 16, 33, it contains what I call one of those troubling promises of God. Now the promises in the Bible for the followers of Christ are wonderful. And there, there's a multitude of them. And as believers in Christ, it's our privilege to stand upon the promises of God. But in all our standing, it's best not to forget this promise in John 16.33. In the world you're going to have trouble, tribulation, hard times, difficulties. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. It's a promise. Let's not try to weasel our way out of it. Don't think, well... This Christian life, really, the Bible says, should be a bed of roses. No. In the world, as long as we live, we're going to have all kinds of trouble. It's guaranteed. The truth is, we are in a very fallen world. And being a follower of Christ is no guarantee of an easy, comfortable life. Actually, just the opposite is true. In John 15 and John 16, Jesus tells his disciples that they will soon weep and lament. That they will all desert him and they'll run away like scared puppy dogs. And then he tells them that they will be hated. They will be persecuted. And that some of them shall be killed for his sake. And yet he tells them at the end of this verse, don't be troubled. Be of good cheer. Be happy. What? Be happy? 
Now I'm sure some of them thought, just like you and I would think, I didn't sign up for this. This wasn't in my job description. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this to his disciples. Rejoice when men persecute you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who slaughter you. Let me ask you a question. Isn't this Christian way completely opposite of what the world teaches? The world says an eye for an eye. Christ says, love your enemies. The world says, revenge. The Bible says, forgive. The world says, run away from your problems. Christ says, let me lead you through the valley. The world says, get ahead at any cost. The Bible says, lend a hand to others and forget about yourself. The world says gain is godliness. The Bible teaches that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and that possessions can be a snare. The world says eat, drink, and be merry. Christ says eat my flesh, drink my blood, and be holy. Jesus said, there are two roads in life, only two roads. There's not three, there's not four, there's not one and a half. There's two separate ways, two separate roads. And one of them is very good, and one of them is very bad. And one of them is wide and broad and well lit, nicely paved, there's pleasure, there's good things and good times. And the other road is narrow, not smooth, filled with dangers, and there are few travelers upon that way. But the narrow way leads to life. The broad way leads to destruction. And so Jesus simply says to me and says to each one of us, what road are you going to take? What road are you going to take? And he says, follow me down that narrow way. There's no question that our days are filled with trouble. And I believe that there's no time to waste. And I believe that I am quite fed up with any lukewarm, mamby-pamby, dishwater doll, Sunday morning only Christianity. Let me dig a little here. Let me, let me make it personal. How do you pray when you pray? Do you pray? Do you take time out of such a busy life? Do you take time to pray? How, but how do you pray? Do you pray for an easy and prosperous life? Maybe you pray like this. Dear Lord, this is Jimmy. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Do you pray for your children and your grandchildren? Something like this. Dear Lord, bless them with a comfortable life. Bless them with a high paying job. And oh Lord, make sure they have good health insurance. And then someday, oh Lord, we can all retire and we can play golf and maybe we'll play some shuffleboard and we'll walk down the ocean beach and pick up pretty shells and oh, it'll be so nice and easy. How about we change our prayers? How about we change them to something like this? Oh God, deliver me from my selfishness. Deliver me from the disease of ease. Help me to love you above all. Help me to take up my cross and follow you. Help me to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. Clean out the garbage in my life. 
Fill me more greatly with the Holy Spirit. Burn that world right out of my heart. Set me on fire, Lord. Set me on fire for Thee. I was reading a Christian magazine the other day, and the magazine was devoted to the church's responsibility in and a response to this pandemic. And a pastor was quoted, and I, I liked what he said, and let me read it. He said, quote, the church of Jesus Christ was made for times like this, to be resilient, responsive, rising above the chaos of the world, to be a light in the darkness, and courage in fear. I like that. The church of Jesus Christ was made for times like this. To be resilient, responsive, rising above the chaos of the world. To be light in darkness. Courage in fear. Beloved, we are to be a light in this darkness. We are to be courageous in the face of fear. This is what we're here for. This is why the church was set upon planet Earth for times just like this. We are called to shine for Jesus Christ and follow him down that narrow road. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, that God would open up our eyes. That God would grant us a new hunger, a new thirst to know him, to follow him, to love him. You might have a nice house and lots of things and money in the bank and a group of drinking buddies and lots of this and lots of that. But if you're not living for Christ, if your soul is asleep, if there's no desire in your heart for him, then the Bible declares that we are spiritual paupers and we are in danger of destruction. Please don't misunderstand this message. Being a follower of Christ is a life of joy, a life of peace, a life of happiness, but it isn't a cheap, sugary Coca-Cola happiness. You know those old commercials that, well, I used to see on TV for Coca-Cola. All the boys and the girls were at the beach and laughing and having a great party. And for some reason, they all lifted their bottles of Coke right at the same time. And they turned it so you could see Coca-Cola with every swig they took. Christ offers us something deeper something different. He offers us a true peace, a true lasting happiness. It is a peace that the world cannot give, and it's a peace that the world cannot understand. It is a joy that's not dependent upon circumstances. You know, whether it's cloudy or not, the sun is shining, we just... It gets hidden a little by the clouds, but the sun is there. And we can live in that place above the clouds of life, enjoying the sunshine of God's love, enjoying the mercy and the rest in God's love. It's his peace. It's that victory that overcomes the world. Well, you might never get your face put on the front page of a newspaper, you might never receive the applause of men. You might be criticized and laughed at. But the rewards of following Jesus Christ are tremendous. They are eternal. As some of you know, I gave my all to Jesus Christ when I was 23 years old. Downtown Albany, New York in an apartment almost adjacent to Washington Park. I was just a young whippersnapper, 
I was 23 years old and confused as a termite in a yo-yo. I'm now on the cusp of becoming 70 years of age. Think of that, 70 years of age. And I think when I turn 70, that will allow me to become a card-carrying, dues-paying member of the worldwide fraternal organization and benevolent brotherhood of old goats. But that's all right. That's all right. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow him down that narrow road. And there's really no turning back. No turning back. Have I stumbled and fallen? Oh, many times. Will I stumble and fall again? Absolutely. But Christ is with me. Christ is with me to help me back up on my feet. Christ is with me to dust me off and if needed, to carry me the rest of the way. Will there be hard times? Will there be tribulations? Will there be other things that come along when this pandemic has disappeared? Absolutely. But I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Will you come with me? Will you follow him? Oh, let's decide to follow Jesus today. Lord, we just thank you for that call to follow you. We thank you that you're here today wanting to draw us closer, wanting our hearts to open in a greater way to you. Oh, it pays to follow Christ. It pays to follow Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. There's no offering, of course. Please send in your financial contributions to the church, it would be much appreciated and you will be blessed. Let's, in closing, sing that hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, number 376. <laughs> Jesus, 
no turning back, no turning back. Amen. Thank you, Wally. Let's bow our heads to receive the benediction and the Lord's blessing. Lord, we just thank you for all that you're doing. All that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives or in this world. We believe that you are Lord. We believe that you are seated upon the throne. That all things are under your control. And that we can place ourselves there by faith. And enjoy all the blessings of God today. Now, dear Lord, we just pray you bless us as we go our separate ways. Help us to walk with you and talk with you today. Help us to know that we're never alone when we're walking with you. Lord, be with us as we drive away this morning. And Lord, be with us this coming week until next Sunday morning, 11 a.m., same time, same place. Same station. God bless you all. Amen.